Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Um, so, to, uh, this, so, so the topic for today is epidemiology. I thought that it would be a little bit uh, break from the oral path. And uh, again, it is very important topic. We all know that epidemiology and ethics uh, compromise a great percentage for the INBD exam. So I thought of like there are only 10 slides, but you know, it's a very important topic and uh, students do not have a lot uh, like a basic clarity about the subject. So let's go ahead and talk about certain studies and hope it helps to you guys. Now let's go ahead and talk about. So basically before going ahead, there are basically two type of studies. The, they are observational studies and the experimental studies. Observational studies are also known as analytical studies. Um, and there is one important point I want to mention over here is that there is no intervention in the observational studies. It's a very important point, guys. Question do come on this. So in observational studies, there is no intervention and in experimental studies, there is intervention. So observational studies are basically collecting data uh, and uh, it observes patient uh, like wh basically what does observational studies mean as the name suggests you observe patients at a point in time or over time and when you do it over time they are known as longitudinal studies and when you do it at a point in time they are known as cross-sectional studies and in experimental studies there is intervention as I already mentioned and intervention is in the researcher's control and is randomized. So the more the randomized the trial is, the, uh, the more the randomized study is, the better it is. Now let's go ahead and talk about certain studies under the observational studies. The first one we're going to talk about today is cross-sectional survey. So cross-sectional survey is an observational studies and it attempts to find an association between a possible factor. A possible factor means a risk factor and a condition. Condition is the disease by collecting data from a population at one specific point in time. When I say one specific point in time means like at the present right now, which is also known as uh, pre uh, prevalence. So one specific point in time is also known as prevalence. So I have mentioned a little a small example over here for cross-sectional survey. If a researcher wants to conduct a study to identify if restoration at the gingival margin can cause gingivitis, they can compare the occurrence of gingivitis in people with or without a gingival restoration at a certain time. Means like at any time, like uh, for example, from today till a certain period of time, they can observe it. Now, at what is the advantage of the cross-sectional survey? It is quick uh, and easy and it covers a whole population and is inexpensive. So these are very important points over here. Sometimes they love to ask the advantages of certain uh, studies. What is the disadvantage? It can only establish an association but not a cause and effect relationship. Cause and effect relationship means like a, a relationship between the risk factor and, a, uh, and the disease. So only, the, only an association can be established by this study. So again, a very important point. Sometimes they love to ask um, out of these studies, which one like uh, can actually have a uh, make, uh, can cause a have an, a cause and effect relationship and which of them not so you if you know this point it is it it helps to answer the question and another thing i want to mention over here is that cross sectional studies uh, they determine prevalence and association not the cause and effect and uh, if they ask you which uh, uh, bias the cross sectional studies are can uh, are associated with it is the social desirability bias very important point again guys and i'm gonna go ahead with the next slide and let's talk about the cohort study now what is a cohort study in a cohort study it is known whether people have been exposed to a treatment or a possible toxic agent means risk is already present so in a cohort study i'm gonna mention this point risk is already present risk is already there um, we're going to talk about if this risk is going to cause the disease or not. So they are then followed for years or even decades to see the effect. Example, one of the most famous studies followed 40,000 British doctors in four cohort studies. 
non-smokers, light, moderate and heavy smokers for 40 years to establish a link between smoking and lung cancer. Advantage, it gives an idea about incidence. So incidence is over a period of time and can establish cause and effect. As we studied in the previous slide, which was the uh, cross-sectional study, it, uh, it gives an idea about prevalence but cannot establish cause and effect. In a cohort study, it gives an idea about incidence and can establish cause and effect. Disadvantages is time consuming because as we already mentioned in the example, it takes at least 40 years to establish, right? It is time consuming. So if it is time consuming, it is going to be expensive as well. So uh, another point I want to mention over here is that cohort studies are best to study rare exposures or short incubation periods. Um, there is another type of uh, cohort study as well, which is known as the retrospective cohort study. So the retrospective cohort study is basically depend upon the databases. Uh, so you can divide cohort study into prospective and uh, retrospective. So the one we discussed over here is prospective, which is very important one. And the retrospective is like uh, the data is already present and you just follow that data like in a hospital. You go to a hospital, you pick up the data of all these cases and you just study them, right? You are not actually doing it over, uh, you know, over a certain population. So, but, and what is the disadvantage of this retrospective cohort study? It is based on hospital data, like there is lack of standardization. Strength is much weaker than the prospective cohort study. And another point I wanna mention over here is that uh, cohort study gave us an idea about incidence and relative risk as well. So incidence and relative risk. Now let's move ahead to the next slide and talk about our next study, which is the case control study. Now. What does happen in the, or what happens in the case control studies? In this type of study, people with a particular condition or disease called cases, so this is very important, are matched with people without condition called the control group. Sorry, the spellings are not right, so it's control. We then look back retrospectively. So we look back to compare how frequently the exposure to a risk factor is present in each group to determine the relationship between risk factor and the disease. So in short, if I have to, you know, um, make it more simple this point, in case control studies, uh, there is already disease present and you're looking at the risk factor by going in the past. So for example, if you have to, uh, if, if there is a certain population and they already have lung cancer present. So you are looking for, and you are trying to establish like if uh, smoking causes lung cancer or not. So what you do is you pick up a certain population with the lung cancer and you go back and uh, you know, you ask those patients if they smoked and uh, how m many times in a day did they smoke? How many packets of cigarette did they smoke? You know, all that questions. So advantage, a cheap way to try to find casual factors. Can, it can establish cause and effect. Now, what is the disadvantage? Require subjects to recall from the past even not as strong as cohort, and it does not give us any idea about incidence or prevalence, right? So in this, the people have to recall. So if anybody asks you what is the bias that is associated with case control studies, it is the recall bias. I'm gonna mention again, very important point, it is recall bias. Now let's move ahead with the next slide and it is the type of these studies and experimental. In the experimental, we're gonna talk about randomized control trials. It is the key feature of RCT. So any new drug that comes in the market, uh, it goes through a trial which is known as RCT. Now these are like a few uh, definitions that I've mentioned over air randomization. The participants are randomly assigned into an experimental group or a control group. So there are basically two groups, experimental group and a control group, independent of any other factors. So randomization is a very important point for RCT. Uh, this is important because it will remove bias, right? So now what is the definition of bias? INBD sometimes loves to ask this question, what is bias? Bias is any factor or process that acts to deviate the result of the study away from the truth. So blinding, this is another important point in RCT. A double blind trial means neither the researchers 
nor the patient know whether the patient are in experimental group or a control group. So randomization and blinding are two important key factors in randomized control trials. It is a gold standard by which all clinical research is judged. Now, let's move ahead with our next slide and these are few terminologies like p-value. What is p-value? p-value is the probability of the outcome to occur if the null hypothesis is true. So null hypothesis is something that um, we are trying to prove wrong. So if we have a study, we have two hypotheses. One is null hypothesis and the other one is the alternate hypothesis. So what is null hypothesis? It is a statement basically that undergoes verification to determine if it should be accepted or rejected. So and another important point in uh, null hypothesis I want to mention is that no statistical significance between variables. And what is alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis uh, you would or I would believe if the null hypothesis is con uh, concluded to be untrue. So if my um, if uh, the alternate hypothesis, so if I have to, for example, if I have to say, uh, let me find a good example over here uh, that comes first on my mind, that um, lung cancer, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, this uh, smoking causes lung cancer. So that is, go uh, so I'm going to say that yes, smoking causes lung cancer. That is going to be my null hypothesis. And if I have to say what is going to be the alternate hypothesis is that smoking does not cause lung cancer. So these are two hypotheses. Now the cutoff is 0 0.05. Above 0 0.05, you tend to accept the null hypothesis. Means, or in other words, you can say that there is weak evidence against the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis if the cutoff is above 0 0.05. If it is below 0 0.05, we have strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So you can successfully reject the null hypothesis and you accept the alternate hypothesis. So basically the cutoff value is 0 0.05. Now let's move ahead with our next slide and talk about a little bit of type of errors. Again, very important point, uh, slide for a INBD exam point of view, type 1 error and type 2 error. In other words, you can call it alpha error or beta error or false positive or false negative. So type 1 error is going to affect sensitivity when the null hypothesis is true but it is rejected. Type 2 error or beta error or false negative will affect specificity when the null hypothesis is false but it is mistakenly not rejected. So these two type of errors are very important um, in epidemiology. So type 1 error means that you are asserting something that is absent. You are actually because it is false positive, right? So you are actually pointing out something that is not even present. And type 2 error is false negative, which means it is failing to assert which is present. So you it, it is false negative. Something is present, but you are not able to find out what. Okay. And uh, sensitivity, a uh, the formulas, I, I let's talk a little bit about going ahead in the slide. Uh, the terminology for incidence and prevalence. As I have already mentioned, prevalence is at a specific point in time. So this is very important at a given point in time and prevalence is uh, uh, the it's a point that we re uh, studied about in cross-sectional studies. What is incidence is the frequency frequency of occurrence of diseases, injury or death, which is the number of transition from well to ill, from injured to uninjured or from alive to dead. It is during the time period of the study. So you were, have, uh, you conducted a study and over the time period, some people who were very healthy, they become, you know, ill. Some people who were ill, they are dead now. So that is known as incidence. What is prevalence? The number of the persons in a defined population who have specific disease or condition at a given point in time. So if I'm trying to conduct a survey or a study like at the present and there is already the uh, certain amount of people who already have the disease. So that is known as prevalence. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about confidence interval. I know lots of students keep on asking me about this. What is confidence interval? Now let's talk a little bit about confidence interval. A confidence interval in statistics 
refers to the probability that a population parameter will fall between a set of values for a certain portion of time. Now, I just to make this a little bit easier, I have an example over here. Now, the interpretation, we always do it as 95%. For example, an odds ratio of 5.2 with a confident 95% confidence interval of 3.2 to 7.2 means 5.2 is actually falling between the range of 3.2 to 7.2 suggest that there is 95% probability that the true odds ratio would likely to lie in the range. Means if, if they give us a certain uh, odds ratio and they give us a certain uh, interval means as a, in this example, which is 3.2 to 7.2 and my 5.2 is actually falling in that certain range. So it just means that there is a 95% probability. So confidence interval is always calculated as a probability, which is mostly 95%. So there is 95% probability that the true odds ratio will likely to be in the range of 3.2 to 7.2. If the odds ratio of 5.2 with 95% confidence interval, this means that the odds ratio is statistically significant and can be relied on because it is falling in between that certain range. So it, in short, it is statistically significant. Now, the another example is that if the odds ratio of 5.2 with 95% confidence interval, which is 0.32, and they give us an interval of 3.3 uh, to 1.2, this means that there is a 95% chance that the confidence interval you calculated contain the true odds ratio, making the odds ratio an example of statistically insignificant. Why? Because it is not falling in between the range that they gave us which is 0.3 to 1.2 so it is statistically insignificant now moving ahead and uh, talking about our last slide we're gonna talk about terminologies again important slide again sensitivity now what is sensitivity the population of true positive disease among all the diseased so if there is a certain population, you are conducting a study and there is a certain population who have the disease. So uh, the number of two positives basically in that population is considered as sensitivity means the disease is present. And how you calculate it is true positive over true positive plus false negative. What is specificity means the disease is not present and sensitivity means the disease is present. The population of true negative among all the non-diseased. So again, how are you going to calculate true negative over true, true negative plus false positive? Once again, I'm going to mention sensitivity will let you know that the disease is present. Specificity means the absence of the disease. So uh, hopefully the, uh, today's lecture did help you guys with uh, did clear some of the basics that we all find epidemiology hard. I hope it did help you guys. If you need any more information or if you have any more questions, please do comment in the comment section. And uh, I, will be, uh, I will be making slides on ethics as well. I know that that's another important topic from INBD exam point of view. And I hope uh, and I will be trying to make it as easy as possible for you guys. Um, I hope this was a great lecture for you guys and please do follow and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You guys can even follow me on Instagram under the same name, INBD Twitter. Have a great day. Bye.